Hello, uh, I'm Mark Britnell. Uh, thanks for inviting me today. We're delighted to sponsor this event. Uh, I worked for the NHS for 20 years, and for the last four years, I've worked uh, for KPMG. I've led organisations at hospitals, regional, national and international level, payer and provider, public and private sector. I've got uh, 20 minutes and quite a few slides. I hope that the slides will be distributed, and certainly I'm going to keep the pace on my presentation. Uh, the first um, message I want to give, uh, whilst endorsing the ambitions for today's meeting, is one of hope and integration. If you remember nothing else from my 20-minute presentation, please remember those words, hope and integration. Uh, the reason why I want to mention the word hope is that I'm sick of people knocking the NHS. I've worked now in uh, 53 countries on 155 occasions. And of course, we can improve, we must do better. But I can assure you that many people around the world, when you place equity, efficiency, and effectiveness together, our NHS still stands up quite proudly in comparison to many international uh, countries that tend to spend, the better ones, at least two or three percentage more of their GDP. So that's the first point I want to make. Just in case you think I'm being soft on the NHS, of course, we know that our scores globally on experience can be much better and we need to be more patient-centred, providing personalised services. Now, uh, later on in this afternoon, we'll talk about the renaissance or the changing reimagination of primary care, personalisation, linking in with health and wellbeing boards. But this presentation now gives you a global snapshot of, I think, some of the uh, thought leaders and leaders of large health systems, what they think is going on. Now, uh, this quote from Davos, as you probably are aware, or you may not be, uh, KPMG's been going for 120 years. Uh, we work in 156 countries, and we get the opportunity to go to Davos. Now, this quote, which I'm not going to read out, tells you about the normal bits and bobs of demography and others as well. And you can see... Um, the point I want to raise here is the last part of this statement that came from Davos a year ago when they were dealing with the global financial crisis, uh, political instability in the Middle East, and global uh, unemployment for our young people. But even they had the time to recognise this. The magnitude of health financing challenges suggests that incremental solutions may not be enough. However, a shared vision of new models for health systems does not yet exist. And it seems to me that the purpose of meetings like this, Anne, is to try and develop that sense of shared purpose. Last year, uh, we conducted research around the world from 3,000 chief executives across 16 different industrial sectors, ranging from energy and natural resources to a sector we called ICE, information, communications and entertainment. Now, this is a busy slide, but you only need to remember two things. Chief execs from all industries spend more time transacting than they do transforming. Their principal objective is to manage cost efficiencies of today, is to, as opposed to preparing their organisation for major business model change of tomorrow. This is all industrial sectors. When we drill into health, do you expect that picture to be brighter or slightly more gloomy? Dr. Charles Bruce, lovely to see you. And of course, the answer is, I'm afraid, that health leaders around the world are more focused on the urgent issues of today and less on the important ones of tomorrow. Now, if anybody here thinks that we can transact our way painfully, slowly and gradually over seven years of very straight financial conditions, please raise your hand now. What we did last year is we got together uh, 40, 45 healthcare leaders from 22 countries across six continents. It's not that important who the people were, but let me just give you a flavour for the people that came to Rome for two or three days to debate some of the most pressing issues in healthcare. So, for example, here, uh, Professor Shan Wang is the chief executive of the largest and most prestigious uh, teaching hospital in, in China, the People's, uh, Peking People's University Hospital. Uh, Claudio Lottenberg uh, runs the largest teaching hospital in South America. Uh, Gary Kaplan, you will know, is a class act leading Virginia Mason. And just above or below him, uh, Sir Bruce Keogh, 
who of course worked with me at University Hospital Birmingham for nearly 10 years. The list goes on. Uh, the medical director from Apollo, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, the point of this is to give you the paradox that they wrestled with over two and a half days. Most people believe that their health sectors need substantial change, but think that their own organisational plans are good. They can't all be right. So the third message I want to give you over hoping change and integration is basically transacting our way out of where we are, given the tectonic forces facing our health system and other health systems around the world, is simply a recipe for disaster. Now, uh, we did some research, uh, first of all in the United States, and then I'll show you some research um, that looks at some of the global uh, feelings as well. Now, these slides are hopping about a bit. But basically, we asked the 200 leading health plans, they're the insurers, public or private sector, hospital systems, and also life science companies, whether they felt that basically their health environment, their local uh, health economy, if you like, uh, was sustainable. And you can see here in a report that's entitled From Volume to Value, that leading hospitals, health plans, and life science executives believe their own individual business models were somewhat sustainable. When you ask them the same question about their health sector, they believe the opposite. Now, I just wondered if we did a poll today across London whether people would say the same thing. My guess is, knowing some of the characters involved, the answer would be yes. Would anybody care to disagree with me? When we asked the leaders in Rome uh, what they felt, uh, this little game that we were playing, they also managed to concur with the view. 75% of them felt that current business models were somewhat sustainable, yet almost all, 95%, believed in moderate or major change. The way I put that simply in the vernacular is, um, I'm all right, but everyone else needs to change. And when we asked them what their strategies were for coping, given that they've already recognised that their systems need to change, nearly all of their responses were deeply transactional. They talked about major cost reduction, the need for lean, more focus, more investment in health IT, and so on and so forth. I'm sure many of us in the audience feel that this is exactly the path we're going down at the moment in our own individual organisations. When we asked them then what payment systems were doing globally, and remember they stretched from Brazil all the way across to Korea and Japan, they were saying, but payment systems are trying to become more integrated have a greater focus on incentives and quality, sharing more risks. And just over one in 10 of those people that participated in Rome felt that their contracting situation would stay the same. The biggest revelation, given that we had 22 countries from six continents, was that most people yearn for, need, and want integration. You can see that the characters that we invited along in Rome, 75% of them believed that integration would reduce cost, and 90% of them believed that integration would improve quality. And we identified five major trends, which I'm going to skip through lightly in the next five or seven minutes. The five major trends are payers are becoming more activist, some hospitals are refusing to be defined and fortified by them bricks and mortar. They want to become health systems. Patients are becoming active partners. The rise of the high growth markets is teaching us about quick adoption of technology. And finally, innovative integration and authentic partnership can only be the way forward for transformation in our health systems. Now, just a couple of uh, points on each of these slides. The activist payer, I think there are two things I want to draw out from this slide. The first one is, I think, uh, an absolute, we should be so grateful we have our GP and primary care system in this country. The registered list is the one, one of the most underexploited assets that we have and we have built since 1948. This idea to segment and stratify and personalize care in terms of actually thinking about the aging population and the rise of long-term conditions is of absolute paramount importance. The second issue which you can see here is moving care upstream. 
and I'm delighted that the councils are here today and also some health and well-being members along with GPs and CCGs. People in other countries would spend a lot of money and give their eye teeth to have the basic foundations that we have developed in British primary care. Secondly, um, one of the issues that we face, of course, in England is a great sense of homogeneity in the way that we provide hospital services. Other parts of the world don't feel the same name, uh, need to be so regimented in a one-size-fits-all offer. And we've detected four different possibilities for provider organisations, hospitals, if you will. The first, of course, is to get bigger through mergers and acquisition. And there's a lot of uh, examples of that happening globally and indeed within countries. The second, as you can see here, and I believe that all organisations have not completed this journey, the absolute relentless pursuit of quality with improvement science, allowing clinical objectives and accountability to managerial endeavour and effort, producing better results at 15 to 20 per cent cheaper costs. I do not believe that we have started or indeed finished that quest in the English NHS. And often I see a lot of distractive talk which takes us further away from this focus, not closer towards it. Thirdly, of course, some hospitals are now moving into the issue of being a health system. So whether it's Geisinger with its uh, vertical integration with primary care, with its Apollo, with its now uh, an insurance policies for 32 million Indian people, becoming a payor and a provider, or indeed in terms of uh, the Albert Einstein using third generation technology to transform some of their business processes, reaching out into the poorer communities, especially in parts of Brazil. And then finally, as has been uh, chronicled over the weekend uh, with the uh, reports last Thursday from Monitor, the idea that we can in enjoy and perhaps should encourage some hospitals to have a greater focus on specialization with the routine predictability that comes with higher quality care and better control and grip over the productive process. Now, all of these are being experimented with. My observation for England is we're not doing as much experimentation as we should. We've all seen this slide. In the 53 countries that I've worked in, one of the first questions I ask ministers and health leaders is what is your percentage of the one, three, and five percent? Now, in this case, this is a slide borrowed from one of our clients, Kaiser Permanente. You can see here that they believe in America, one percent drives 30, five percent drives 50, and 10 percent drives 80 percent of cost. The real, I think, transformation journey is making sure we understand those citizens as they live and work, and then apply and reassemble this value chain. And I believe that the reimagination of primary care is probably of central importance to the future prosperity of the English National Health Service. Now, we can have a debate later on about what this means for you, but essentially, actually providing more personal and tailored care for those people, obviously some of which uh, have uh, or come from uh, poor environments, I believe that we can link equity, efficiency, effectiveness and experience in transforming the care that we uh, provide for these people. It can't just be done within healthcare, it has to be done in partnership with health and local authorities. Uh, my colleague Andrew Hine has a pound in his pocket, and I, forgive me if you know the answer to this question, I'm going to play a quick game. On average, what does the average European citizen consume in healthcare? On average, how many hours a year? Would anybody like to guess? If I said that Andrew Hine had 10 pounds in his pocket, would anybody care to guess? Penny Dash, you're a very clever person. What's the answer? Where is Penny? I thought I saw her a moment ago. She's disappeared now. Cyril, would you like to guess? Cyril Chandler? One hour. Close. Um, the average number of hours that the average healthcare citizen rather consumes is four hours a year. And there are over 8,600 uh, hours in a year. The point is, we have to start to think about how we provide great medical care, sure, but how we actually keep citizens healthy. And this seems to me, uh, in spite of the reforms, the opportunity of local authority and health service to work together, to concentrate on the 8,500, as well as the four hours, is, it seems to me, a transformational task worth walking towards. 
Patience is partner. Yes, it's a cliche, but you now know whether it's a technical Krankenkasse in Germany, whether it's discovery in South Africa, whether it's patient-powered care from Nestor in England, there is good evidence now that actually looking at the five or six long-term conditions that produces most of the morbidity and indeed mortality in countries, if you give patients more control through a series of measures which we now have a good evidence base, costs seem to be reducing by about 7% per annum. This seems to me to be a very good thing. My good friend and, and former uh, colleague, Tim Kelsey, no doubt will talk to you about the power of the transformative and transparency uh, agenda. And I know that Tim believes most passionately in this. Three things about high growth countries that we can learn from. I'm not suggesting today we all become Indian or Chinese. The three things are they regiment through clinical consensus, care pathways, where clinicians are held to account and made responsible for adherence to those care pathways, point one. Point two, they use information technology to ensure that they capture that value in that new value chain as soon as possible and often, as in the case of Apollo, report to their, clinici their clinicians the day after in terms of any substantial deviation. And thirdly, they do not, because they have not been trapped in the last 100 years of Western healthcare, they no longer respect, if they ever did, the artificial boundaries of primary, secondary, and tertiary care. My own personal reflection is, as we talk about shifting care from tertiary to secondary, secondary to community, community to primary, primary to home, I'm reminded of that great uh, song, All Things Bright and Beautiful. Do you remember it? Where God sits on the top and everyone knows their place. We have to start moving away from that and see home as the organising principle of healthcare in the 21st century. And finally, in my 20 minutes or so, given that this is a leadership conference today, I just wanted to say three or four things about the importance of leadership. What we noticed in Rome, and you'll be acutely aware that there's the turnover in England at the moment is frankly a disgrace. It is a threat to uh, patient care that people stay around long enough to build trust, which builds motivation, which builds strategy, which builds vision, which builds energy, which creates change. So you need to, if you want to move from volume to value, you need to cherish your leaders, ensure that they stay there long enough. So yes, of course, they can see their mistakes, but also they can celebrate their successes. And of course, as you know, uh, know better than I, most other countries don't see targets as an end in themselves. Perhaps at best they might see them as a means to an end. So in conclusion, before I hand on to Tim, these are 10 characteristics that were identified from our uh, conference in Rome. You'll have seen the words before, and clearly whichever leadership course you care to go on, I would imagine that 80 or 90% of these words and these phrases will be found in those textbooks and those courses. What I do want you to bear in mind as I finish is when you read through all of these things, apart from being axiomatic, they're based on trust and an ability to see further ahead than the end of one financial year. They're based on strong values and I think an ability and a commitment to partner in a different way. So in conclusion, I think this issue of hope and integration is very important. And if I had to be honest with you at the moment, and I hope we can talk about this through questions and answers, my fear for the English NHS is that we're obsessed with transacting when we should be obsessed with transforming. Thank you very much indeed.